Liesl Riddle, the dean at George Washington University, who had a child. She could empathize with me. Mm -hmm. She encouraged me. My interaction with Ed Summers. The more I could talk to these individuals who could really understand what I was going through, that's what really changed my mindset. And so when I came to LCA, it was the first time I felt like I could. It was like coming out of the closet of a blind person. Yeah. It was like this feeling of really being, okay, now I'm out there. Let's do this. Because I don't want anyone else to feel that way that they can't be their true self. And I don't want anyone else to leave Cary, North Carolina. Think about it. We have, what, how many people come in here every single day? Right. Why do people with disabilities need to say, I can't be here? And that's what I want. I want people to be on that level playing field and be able to have the same experiences as everyone else. Thank you for listening to the Guys Who Do Stuff podcast. Visit guyswhodostuff.com. You probably shouldn't Google that. Welcome to the Guys Who Do Stuff podcast. I'm Joe. Josh is out today, but I'm here with my very special guest, John Samuel. It's great to have you on the show. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Joe. I'm really excited to be here. John is the CEO of Abler, correct? Yes, I am. I'm the CEO and co-founder. And people with disabilities who have abilities and helping people grow their business through accessibility and disability inclusion. Very cool story. I really want to get into it, but start by telling us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I'm actually one of those few people who are born here, raised in Cary, North Carolina. They're one of like the eight people that exactly. were here originally. Exactly. So <laughs> one of the original settlers people in the studio. <laughs> yeah, but the funny thing is I'm one of those few Indian people, right? Now, now Cary is very diverse, but as growing up here in, in Cary, I was one of those few so you were here before it was cool. It was, yeah. it was, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, but I spent the uh, majority of my childhood until third grade. Then my dad was working for this company called Nortel Networks. Okay. Which yeah, is one of the big uh, mm-hmm. landmark companies here. And then it took us out to New Jersey and then to Tokyo and then came back home and uh, went to middle school and high school here. Wow. So tell us a little bit about the story of how you got into Abler. Like how did you become the founder of that organization? Yeah. When I was in college, I was diagnosed with this degenerating eye condition called retinitis pigmentosa. I was in Virginia Commonwealth University up in Richmond, and I knew I had some issues in my eyes. I just thought everybody saw the same way. But when I was in college, I was walking into too many things. I started getting hurt. I bumped into things, and I was getting just something was really off. So I told my parents and got checked out by the doctor, and they diagnosed me with a degenerating eye condition called retinitis pigmentosa, and they told I was going blind. Wow. So you said that you... So was your vision always impaired from your perspective or do you, looking back now, do you think it was ever what people would call normal? Yeah. So when I was nine years old, I think that was the first time I really noticed something. I was looking up at the sky and I, I could see the stars. The next summer I came back and was looking up at the stars and I couldn't see the stars anymore. Wow. While other my sister and my cousins could see it, but I couldn't. And then I realized that something is changing here. And then when I was in in high school, I just thought maybe I was a bad driver or maybe I just wasn't as good at basketball as I thought I was. And I couldn't see things on the wall, like on the chalkboard. And But I didn't say anything. I just thought maybe I'm partying too much. Maybe something else is going on <laughs> that is just causing me not to be able to see properly. And But it was really when I got to college that I realized this is something, something drastically off. Yeah. So how did that realization hit you after the diagnosis? As a young person, the first thing that goes to your mind is, what kind of girl is going to want to be at the guy who can't see? That's the first <laughs> thing that went through my mind. And then it was like, where am I going to be able to work if, if I'm blind? And then where am I going to be able to live if I can't drive? Definitely not here in Cary and Raleigh. And so I said, I had to get out of here. And But at the time I was in uh, up in Richmond and those kind of questions consumed me and I ended up failing out of college. And I found myself coming back home to Raleigh and I, I moved in with my buddies who were going to NC State. And eventually, I found a little loophole. And then so you were 25-ish at this point? No, I was actually 20. Okay, okay. And and so I came back, and I was my friends were still in college, and I went to the lifelong education program at NC State, so they could give you seven credits each semester. Like auditing? Yeah, so they were, like, for people who continued education, yeah. who wanted to continue to take some courses. So it's really two classes and a, like, really a gym class or something. So I took seven credits for the spring semester and then two summer sessions and then one winter session or fall session. And by the, that year I finished 28 credits and then I eventually did that. And I took so many credits that they had to let me into the, into NC state. Wow. So I hustled my way into college <laughs> and then I finished up and I said, I had to get out of here. And that's when I decided to go out to Bangalore, India, because I knew I could get a car and driver. 
because I was still driving in North Carolina, but I knew I should not have been. And how could you get a car and driver? Just, it was more affordable? More affordable. Okay. Exactly. So with my salary there, I could afford it. And uh, so I went out there and, uh, and I'm, I am of Indian descent, but going out there was really challenging because it was that reverse. You know? Had you ever been to India visiting before? Yeah. I had the opportunity to go every year as a kid to the Southwest part of India called Kerala, where my family's from, but I was in a bigger city called Bangalore. And it was a young, hip city. It was where all the tech businesses were coming up. And it was, it was really, socially it was fun, but professionally it was really challenging. And, but after two years there, I decided to come back to the U.S. and move to New York City. And when I moved to New York, I was like, well, they have a great public transportation system. I could probably get a job in the city. I could probably... Was Uber a thing yet? No, this was in 2008. Okay. And the taxis, everything, it was just still much more accessible for me in that way. Sure. Because right? my vision, I was still deteriorating, but I wasn't talking about it very often. And when I got to New York, I moved in with uh, one of my, one of my uh, old college buddies. I moved down on his couch and, and I was like that New York kind of lifestyle. I was like, oh, I live on this guy's couch and I'll find a job. And I found a job with the city of New York during the recession, providing financial education for our city employees. And, and it was great. It was a really cool experience. I got to see all of the different five boroughs walking around. And, but I, I started looking at my friends and their career trajectories were just a lot different than mine. And I just didn't think I was going to be able to keep up with them in New York. And I went through another depression. That's funny because when I went through the, when I first got the diagnosis, I go through that dark times. And now was, in my professional career, I was like, oh, I'm not going to have the same type of career as these folks. Mm-hmm. And but it was around that time I reconnected with a guy named Steve Clemens, who I worked with in that company in India. And he, he was on the board of directors of this company called Aster. And they were a tower manufacturer, like a cell phone tower. Okay. And they wanted to move, set up co- operations in uh, Cameroon. And uh, when I heard this opportunity, I jumped at it. I said, hey, send me out there. I had no idea where Cameroon was. I thought it was in the Caribbean. So I was like, oh, this would be great. Yeah, I was going <laughs> to ask. I didn't want to sound like a dumb, not world traveler, but I don't know where Cameroon is. Yeah, <laughs> so Cameroon's in West Central Africa. Okay, okay. It's like the armpit of Africa, if you think about <laughs> it. Yeah, so I, I jumped at the opportunity. But I had to convince the executives of the company. Because once they found out that it couldn't see, they didn't know what to do. Mm. They had already offered me the job. And so they gave me six months. They said, all right, we'll give you six months. You do it. And then if whatever happens, we'll just wash our hands and we'll go our separate ways. So I took a $20,000 investment and I moved out to Douala, Cameroon from Manhattan. And I was told to go start this new business. And so it was funny. I remember listening to one of your podcasts about somebody moving out to a, a foreign country and not knowing how to speak the language. And in Cameroon, you know, they had two major languages, English and French. Okay. And I had no idea about French or so I had to immediately try to learn French. But I also had to figure out a way to convince people that I could see. I didn't want people to know because out of security reasons, I didn't want people to know that I couldn't see. But I, I took this $20,000 investment and I launched this business. And in 14 months, we generated $12 million in revenue, $2.4 million in profit. And, and then I spread that, that, that business across the continent. And by the time, three years I was there, we had operations in eight countries and sales in 22. So at what point did you get to stop pretending that you were blind? Or what, you said it was a security thing. So why were you needing to pretend that you were blind for security reasons? Or you weren't blind? Yeah, because I was, I was by myself. I didn't want people to know. And so my colleagues, my, the people I was working with, we never talked about it, but they were very protective of me. My, so did you just, how'd you pull that off? Did you just get the meetings first and you're there and. So we had a whole choreographed way. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. yeah I so I, I was like, that's not a simple thing to pull off. Yeah. So the, one of the very first things that ever happened to me when I moved to Cameroon, I had found a taxi driver to take me around, but he started ripping me off and I was staying at this hotel and I was looking for a taxi and this one taxi driver had seen me, noticed me that I couldn't see. And he told me, go back into the hotel. I'll come back and get you in a second. And he went out and he dropped off somebody, came back. His name was Blaze and he never left my side for three years. What a cool name. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but Blaze was, uh, he became my right-hand man. Everywhere I went, he was there. He, he didn't know English that well, so it was good for him to practice his English with me. And I could practice my French with him. But he, he became my right-hand side. And then I built this team around me. And so I was operating out of this hotel. So you have startups who start out of a garage. I was starting out of this hotel. So I had seven people in my hotel room. We'd meet in the, like, the lobby of the hotel, and that's where I'd have my meetings. So I knew exactly where I was going to sit. I, we'd go to the same restaurant for dinner or meetings like that, and my coworkers would pull out the seat for me out of respect. Right? People were like, oh, that's how the culture is. But they were actually just making sure I knew where I was going to sit. And so we, we had a whole choreographed way of getting around. 
and I would use all my other senses. When I traveled around Africa, I would listen to the suitcases. I would listen. That's how I'd follow people. I just try to figure out ways like that. But yeah. we, uh, we, we eventually did it. Okay. So you started this successful startup kind of really put to bed, like the, can this guy do it for as yep. far as your employers were concerned? And then what was the next chapter like? Yeah. So right before I left Africa, I had, I really set two goals for myself when I moved to Africa. I said, Hey, I want to be a top 30 executive under 30 in Africa. They didn't have any such records or anything, but I felt like I achieved that. And then the other one was I wanted to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. And that was really about you know, kind of overcoming these physical challenges that I've been doing over my life, but I wanted to really do something. And, and on June 5th, 2012, I accomplished that, uh, that goal. So that, with that kind of experience under my belt, I felt like I was ready to come back to the U.S. Yeah. And what was your experience climbing Mount Kilimanjaro? It was, it was awesome. I heard one of your podcasts uh, that you guys did with somebody who climbed Mount Kilimanjaro and right, shares yeah. his business case around it. But mine was a little bit different. I was going with just one of my buddies and we had two guides and we had a couple of porters who were helping us. So a smaller group. A much smaller group. And uh, the first day I tried to explain it that there's like this, this launch meeting, like this kickoff meeting, like, all right, this is what we're going to be doing. And I told them, I said, hey, I have this vision problem. And they're like, oh, you're going to do it well. You're going to do it perfectly. It's going to be fine. And after the first day, they said, oh, you're not going to make this. And they said, my friend was a lion and I was just a man. And that just put me down. I was like, oh, gosh. But then it fueled me. I said, I'm going to do this. Mm. And, and it took us uh, five and a half days to get up there. And it's interesting. A lot of people go when they try to climb a mountain, they go up and they come back down. They acclimate. Because I walk so slow, we didn't have the time or the need to actually go up and down. Because it took me just as long just to go you were acclimating along the way, basically. Acclimating along the way. And in the other podcast, you talk about people coming down on stretchers. We didn't have that type of medical um, attention, mm -hmm. but we saw people just on the side of the mountain who just didn't make it. And it was like the, the tortoise and the hare. We were the tortoise who just slowly made it up there and, and we summited it. And it was probably one of the one of the highlights of my life. Wow. It took you five days. Five and a half. Yeah. Yeah. What did they take back? The you're just a man and he's a lion phrase. It was funny because afterwards they all want to take pictures and put it on their brochures. And I was like, no, this, yeah, <laughs> this, no. exactly right. <laughs> but uh, no, they were really good people who were, they did get to empathize and understand that proximity builds empathy. They mm -hmm. spent the five and a half days with me and they saw how I overcame challenges and how my friend would communicate. Yeah, And that was really one of the key things. And my buddy would uh, communicate and talk to me what I was about to come, up, come across on the journey. And, uh, and that was really, it brought us closer. And it was interesting when we were going to the bathroom, there were just holes in the ground. And what's love when your buddy will, will line you up to go, <laughs> to go to the bathroom in a little hole. It's like the weirdest version of the crane game. <laughs> little left, little left. Exactly. So that, that's love. And that was one of my, my best friends and he's still a big part of my life. And yeah, but do you um, still keep in touch with Blaze. I do. Actually, before I left, I bought him a laptop so that he can uh, reach out and he uh, stays in touch on Facebook. And uh, you know, cool. it's just a really, you know, that's one of the best things in my life is I've had these amazing people throughout my life who've, who've really just uh, supported me and been my allies. And they're the ones who've gotten me to where I am today. So you, you summited Kilimanjaro. Yep. You feel like, all right, I did what I needed to do here in Africa and yep. you're heading back to the States. What was your plan coming back to the States? I wanted to do my MBA. And so when I was thinking about places in the U.S. where I could go, I was thinking about New York City or Washington, D.C. And I started reaching out to different colleges or universities about my interest in their, in their, their programs. And only one program reached out with a unique like, note or something. And it was the dean of the business school at George Washington University. And for somebody who had failed out of college, it was really amazing to see this person who was interested in, in really talking to me. Yeah. And, and so she asked me to come out and visit them in Washington, D.C. And I went to the campus. It was right in the middle of, of the city, public transportation everywhere. And, and I thought this was a really good fit. The, the people I met were great. And I was like, I'm already in D.C. I might as well go to Georgetown. And I went over to Georgetown's MBA office. And when I got there, I said, hey, I came here from Cameroon and want to learn more about the program. And they said, oh, everything's online. And so that's when I just said, oh, I'll step back out of here and I'm not going to apply here because... I'm not getting that same type of love. Yeah. And I ended up being the best decision of my life. So after your MBA, when did we get into the Abler? Yeah, I think the there's a little bit part of that MBA story that helps me get to Abler. Because when I was doing my MBA, 
It was my first week of orientation and I was at a networking event and they had these name cards where you're supposed to go sit and I couldn't see. And so I turned to the person next to me and it happened to be the uh, the dean of the business school. And I told her I couldn't see and asked her if she could help me. And uh, she had no idea. She's the one that recruited me, but I hadn't told them. And so she helped me find my seat and she, uh, she could empathize with me because her son had uh, special needs and uh, she encouraged me to be open about my vision loss with my classmates. and, And that's what I did. And I often say that was the first time I could be my authentic self and I could open up my heart and I met my wife and um, in the program and I was starting to look for jobs after my MBA and I just couldn't find anything. Companies would, I was doing a great job on these phone interviews, but when they met me, they weren't expecting a guy who couldn't see because I thought I didn't want to disclose it because I didn't, I thought companies would think it was a liability. And so after my MBA, I ended up landing on my feet with a crowdfunding platform. But in 2017, that company folded. And I found myself without a job. And now I had a wife and I had a, we just built a house in DC and we just had a baby. And the stress of all these things just caused my eyesight just to deteriorate even faster. And I didn't know what was going to happen to me. I can no longer see the computer screen now. And so I, at the time, my buddy sent me this, this article about this software that was, that was designed at SAS over in Cary. Mm-hmm. That was designed to help people who are blind visualize graphs and charts using sounds. And I thought it was pretty cool. But what was really cool was the guy who designed it. His name was Ed Summers, and he had the same eye condition as me and lived in Cary, the same place I never thought I could ever live. Wow. And uh, up until this point, I had never met another blind person. So I tried for a couple months to get in touch with him. No luck. And then finally, my wife said, if he can live down in North Carolina, maybe we can too. And so we found this house online and we told my folks and they got so excited and they never thought I was coming home. Yeah, because your folks are still here then? Yeah, okay. exactly. And my dad immediately jumps in the car as we're talking to him on the phone to go look at this house. <laughs> and <laughs> so we're looking at the house. Your dad's like, yeah, okay. I got the GPS pulled up. Where are you at? I'm driving. Exactly. <laughs> he starts driving and he's driving and he starts yelling at something. I was like, what are you doing, dad? He's like, oh, there's a blind guy on the road. Maybe it's the guy you're trying to get in touch with. It's like, dad, please don't yell blind people on the road. It's like, don't yell at anyone on the road. He's just helping out. Exactly. And he's like, all right, all right. Gets out of the car and walks over to this guy and says, are you Ed Summers? And the guy says, yes, I am. Oh, what are the odds? And my dad says, my son's on the phone. He's trying to reach you and just puts a phone in this poor guy's ear. And uh, <laughs> Is this the way your dad's life works oh, yeah. for him? He's exactly. just, yeah, I drive to the house. You got to find this guy. Ed Summers, that's probably him. Exactly. <laughs> my dad, he was a, he was an executive in Nortel and you can understand how he got there. This guy who just, he goes for it. You can, he always gets the meeting. He got the meeting with Ed. So, so you're on the phone with Ed. Yep. How's that conversation go? So after apologizing, I was like, hey, I came down <laughs> Sorry and about my dad. Sorry about my dad. <laughs> and he's like, all right, I'll have coffee. So I came down and met him for coffee. And, uh, and here I am meeting this guy at Starbucks over on Harrison in, in Western Parkway. He's uh, sitting outside and he's we're, we're having this conversation. He starts emailing like conversation introductions for me. And uh, I'm like, how is this blind guy doing this? And he opened up my eyes to this whole world of accessibility mm-hmm. and voiceover and screen readers. And what year is this? This is in 2017. Okay. In May, around that time, yeah, April, May 2017. So tell me a little bit about what's different between accessibility programs than what most people would think of when they think of voiceover text like Surrey or Alexa. Yeah. When we think about accessibility, where the screen reader is really about reading what's on your computer screen, that overlay. So it's, it's reading all the different apps. Okay. And uh, so it can read emails, It's but we're using keyboards. Instead of using a mouse, you're using your keyboard to navigate everything. So on your iPhone, you're swiping left or right, okay. and it's going to read you the different lines, words, whatever you want it to. And, and so when Ed was on, the, on his phone, he was doing it because the saddest day for me was the day I had to give away my BlackBerry. And the tactileness was gone for me. Yeah, we all miss the QWERTY keyboard. Exactly. I was like, <laughs> well, I can't feel it anymore. I can't do this. I was like, how am I going to use my phone? And uh, here's this guy who's totally blind and just zooming through and doing all these things. And uh, that was cool. And he told me, he's like, hey, I got one piece of advice for you, man. He's like, if you want to continue your career trajectory, you're going to have to learn as a blind person. And so I went back to DC and I was like, what does this mean? Really? And, and I'm and fighting that. You've been oh, yeah, yeah. avoiding disclosing it at all costs because in your words, you thought it was a liability and he's telling you to lean into it. Exactly. He told me about all these diversity and inclusion programs and companies here in North Carolina. You should reach out to them. So I did. And I didn't get a single call back from anybody. Mm. Not one. And, and I told it, I was like, man, I'm struggling here. I can't find a job and I'm disclosing it. And I was wondering, I was like, if somebody with my experiences, my education and my privilege can't find a job, I can't imagine other people with disabilities. And that's when he's, I got to introduce you to someone. And he introduced me to the president of LCI 
And who knew that the largest employer of Americans who are blind was based seven miles from where I grew up in an old Nortel building. Wow. And uh, so I met with Jeffrey Hodding and he was talking about wanting to create new technology-based jobs. And uh, that's what I joined LCI to start and uh, to create a new business around that. So what were some of the hurdles? So you said LCI was the, the largest employer for the blind. Yep. And strategically located seven miles from where you actually grew up, which yep. is crazy to think about. But they wanted to create jobs in the tech field. So what were the obstacles that they had to overcome to create jobs for, I assume, jobs for blind people in the tech field? That's correct. So when we started thinking about it, you know, I looked at our office and we had a customer service department that was mm-hmm. like 13 people and 11 people were blind or low vision. And I said, all right, let's take this and we can do something like blind sourcing. Let's go to different companies. Let's get carved out of their call centers. But when we started looking at the, the call center software, we realized it just wasn't accessible. And that means that it can't be used by that assistive technology, right. that screen reader. So technology. I assume there has to be some kind of language or hooks that will allow the screen reader to figure out what's on the screen and read it back. Exactly. It has to be labeled properly. If you think about you know, web development, if you do your best, like actually follow right. the rules and the best practices, it's going to be accessible, but often trying to cut corners or just make it faster. Yeah. People, people want to buy that $20 website from. <laughs> exactly. Right. They want to get that, just that, you know, that, that generic template that's not going to be accessible. And that's why you really need to work with actual web developers. But, and that's one of the things that we just saw the software just wasn't accessible. And, and so that's when I said, let's take a step back and let's pivot and let's focus on digital accessibility so that we can ensure that people of all abilities can then access this information because then that's only where we're going to set them up for success. Yeah. So you're like, that's a problem, but let's tackle this ginormous problem. <laughs> with exactly. Digital accessibility. Cause now you're talking anything you consume digitally, correct? That's correct. We start thinking about the barriers that were hindering people who are blind. Why are people who are blind or people with disabilities not in the workforce? Cause there's a 70% unemployment rate. This is before COVID. Okay. 70% of people who are blind are unemployed. And why is that? And accessibility was one of those big things. Transportation was one of those big things. And then education and training. And then also, I think you have to think about the cult the culture mindset of people. That could be the fourth problem. With COVID, transportation is out of the picture. Leveled the playing field in it a did. sense. Yeah, that's one of the silver linings. Yeah. When you talk about the silver linings, we figured out how to do all these jobs remotely. Yeah, giant companies that were afraid to work from home for forever because they didn't know if it was going to work. Figured that out in the first month of COVID. Right, they? they do that pretty fast. <laughs> right? It's like, oh yeah, it turns out Zoom, Teams, all that stuff does work. Look at that. Exactly. And so that benefits the, the disability community where transportation is such an issue. But that accessibility was one that we were going to tackle. And uh, so when we think about what we wanted to do is really eliminate the digital divide. We wanted to create pathways for employment. That's getting the education training for people. And then also changing the mindsets of companies and organizations. And so that's what we started thinking about. Those are the major barriers that we had to tackle. And so we first started off with the accessibility services and that's what LCI Tech started to launch. And so how did it go from LCI Tech to Abler? Yeah. So in 2019, beginning of 2019, so I mentioned the diversity and inclusion folks who did not reach out to me. I was contacting them. No company was you know, replying to me. When I got the job with LCI Tech, I realized I'm going to get involved in this diversity and inclusion space. And I started to attend all these, the chain, Raleigh Chambers, DEI task force and, and mm-hmm. so forth. But it was really about a compliance issue. It still felt like there's this whole idea, but it was really made up of a, a people who were in HR or a legal compliance piece. But I was at this tech conference in 2019 and I heard uh, the CEO of Walk West, Donald Thompson, speaking about diversity and inclusion in the tech space. And it was the first time I heard somebody outside of the traditional DEI community talking about it, and specifically in a business context. And so he offered to meet anybody for uh, coffee, and uh, I jumped at the opportunity. And he never thought about people with uh, disabilities in the diversity and inclusion context, and he didn't think about people with disabilities in the tech world. And so we kept in touch and, and he said, there's something here. Yeah. And, and 18 months later, we, we launched a new joint venture uh, just on October 5th of this, uh, this past month. And uh, yeah, it's a joint venture that's really focused around removing the barriers that have hindered people with disabilities from all aspects of life, including entertainment, education, retail, and, and employment. Yeah, you mentioned like the, the three things that you guys are working on, eliminating the digital divide. So that's the stuff you're, you're talking about now, yep. creating pathways through education and changing the mindset of companies. I have to imagine of those three, changing the mindset of companies is the challenging one. That really is. And so 
we are, that's one of the big things we're trying to do right now. It's really providing consulting services and training. Right. So we're right now in the process of creating um, a disability inclusion training module, which we're going to launch in early 2021. And so that's really about breaking down those barriers from the recruiters to the hiring managers to the uh, training and development folks so that we can get all the buy-in because it can often come from the direction can come from the CEO level down, but then it's those people who have to actually execute it. And that's where we really want to make sure that the people who have to execute the vision of the leader, yeah. the leadership team, that they're going to have the tools and be ready to be able to accomplish that. And I think I'm looking at your, your website now, it's Abler360, no E, so it's A-B-L-R 360.com. And now uh, there's a stat on there that says $6.9 billion annually is the amount of money that e-commerce retailers might be losing annually to their competitors with more accessible websites. So there is a strong driving financial factor to fix the accessibility issues on your platforms as a company for sure. And I think that was probably the point that people get immediately right off the bat. But then, as you said, dealing with HR people and helping them understand that inclusion is the right thing to do for their company when it probably from a company standpoint just feels like more uh, work. Yep. Yeah. And really there's a business case to it. There's the right thing to do. And then there's a legal case, right? right. I am, my personal view is we put the legal to the back end, right? I don't want to, I know that drives a lot of people that risk management, risk mitigation, yeah. but you know, I just don't want to drive a wedge between the disability community and business. But once we see that, if you make it more accessible for one group, like for people with disabilities, mm -hmm. you're actually going to improve the user experience for everybody in that whole organization. Because you never know when somebody may have a temporary disability, someone breaks a leg, or somebody has a, our aging population. There's so many people who are going to benefit from this that you just don't know. And caregivers. There's people who have caregivers of children, caregiver of their parents. It's a, The disability community is it's really large. And when you think about 26% of people in the world have a disability. And then well, I think it's 31% of people have a friend or family member with a disability. So if you think about that as a the actual person with a disability plus their right. immediate kind of community, that's a huge number of people. And so it's really important to think about that, not just from a, you know, the legal case, but think about the business case. You're missing out on a lot of business out there. Yeah. I liked what you said earlier. You said proximity builds empathy. And I think for those, if you look at those stats you were just saying, that means about 50% of people don't know and haven't really interacted much with somebody with a disability. And that proximity building empathy doesn't get a chance to kick in for those people. And so it's an issue that doesn't ever come to their attention. But I think that's part of the elegance of what Abler 360 stands for is because by making companies places where there you've removed the limiting factors that prevent people with disabilities from working for a company, things like the digital divide, the creating the pathways and changing the mindset of the company. Now you've created an opportunity for much more of these relationships to be built and to put people in position where, because if you think if that number is correct, 26% of people, like that's, that's one in four. Like we yep. should, it shouldn't be that 50% of people know nobody with a disability. Exactly. And that's the thing. A lot of it also is invisible disabilities. Mm -hmm. learning disabilities, right? Intellectual sure. disabilities that people just don't know. Yeah. And so unless you have those conversations and people feel comfortable in disclosing it, mm -hmm. self-identification is such a big you know, challenge right now for businesses. Because if you don't feel comfortable talking about it, because remember, I didn't talk about it because I thought it was a, people would think it was a liability. Right. But once we can take away that stigma and companies can see, all right, we want you to be your authentic self because when you are your authentic self, you're going to bring more to the business. And you're going to, you're going to bring your whole self. And that's what we want. That's what we're paying for. We're going to pay more for that. Right? We're not just going to pay for 50% of who you are. We want to pay for hundred percent of that. Relevant Media Solutions believes that marketing is storytelling. They help take business owners from feeling scared that their ineffective website is losing business, embarrassed of their online presence, and worry that their customers are not finding them. To business leaders with a useful website that grows their business and sees customers return. Let them help you tell your story. Visit RelevantMediaSolutions.com today. This show is produced at Podcast Carry, a professional studio making podcasting simple and fun. Located in Vibe Coworking in Cary, North Carolina. 
Want to start a podcast to create great content for your business and establish yourself as a thought leader in your city? Go to podcastcarry.com. Connect with your audience. Grow your brand. Was part of your journey of not disclosing about your disability, was that solved after you achieved some kind of personal success? Like you went to Africa and you did what you wanted to do. You grew the company. Or was it more of a an emotional, personal thing? Was it the conversations with people like Ed Summers of saying, you should probably lean into this instead of hide this? What was that what was that transition? Because now I think it's something with Abler360.com and your company and what you're doing. It's obviously not a back burner thing for you that you're trying to hide from people yep. anymore. Although it's a really cool premise of a cool like 90s like uh, like heist movie to trick people <laughs> into thinking like you got this team around you and this ballet of people not knowing that you have the disability. But so how did that journey play out for you? So I think it's when I met Liesl Riddle the dean at George Washington University, who had a child. She could empathize with me. Mm -hmm. She encouraged me. My interaction with Ed Summers. The more I could talk to these individuals who could really understand what I was going through, that's what really changed my mindset. And so when I came to LCA, it was the first time I felt like, I, uh, it was like coming out of the closet of a blind person. Yeah, It was like this feeling of really being, okay, now I'm out there, let's do this. Because I don't want anyone else to feel that way that they can't be their true self. And I don't want anyone else to leave Cary, North Carolina. Think about it. We have, what, how many people come in here every single day? Right. Why do people with disabilities need to say, I can't be here? And that's what I want. I want people to be on that level playing field and be able to have the same experiences as everyone else. What's life like different now that you are your authentic self? You keep using that phrase there versus when you are trying to downplay or not disclose. Yeah, I wouldn't be here, right? You no, know, Josh saw me on the, on the <laughs> pumpkin patch because I was open about using my cane. And before I didn't use a cane. It was only after, it took me a year after joining LCI even to start using a cane. And Ed Summers had to tell me, he's like, dude, we're friends now. You got to go use a cane. Because I was walking in, I was, you know, we were going to the Starbucks. I was embarrassing him. I was walking in his stuff. <laughs> he's just navigating with this guide dog. And, and here I am bumping into everything. But it took me some time to really come to grips with it. And once you're able to use that white cane, now everybody knows there's no hiding it, right? When you see that cane. Yeah. Um, and that's part of it. And once you're able to do that, it, it's really liberating and it's a, it's a great feeling. And every day I'm, I'm really excited. I just posted something on LinkedIn yesterday or about how daylight savings time when it ends on just ended yesterday. And that's like the, the worst day of my, of the, of the year for me because I lost an hour of light. And but now with my cane and the assistive technology I use, I've leaned into it and now I have a whole nother, I have every day is, is the same for me. I don't have to care if there's light outside or not. It's every, I know I'm, I'm comfortable getting around no matter what. We had a, we got to have a guest on Matthew Schwab and he, he used some of the same language that you're talking about inclusion and being your authentic self. And I think that there's in a, there's an awakening. It seems like in the disabled community about, Hey, we're not going to let this perception that people have of yep. ourselves continue to be a limiting factor in the way that we want to live our lives. And then there's also in that movement, this idea of we demand equality in workplace situations, which from a common sense standpoint is, of course, that should be a thing. But like you're saying, it's got some challenges. So let's talk through what does Abler 360 do? What kind of services do you provide and how are you making a dent into that? Yeah. So first, we're, one of the main parts of our business is that digital accessibility services. So making sure that websites, career pages are accessible. Mm -hmm. And so that's the external facing websites. Then we also are helping companies with their internal facing programs and software to make sure that's accessible. And so that's our beachhead. That, that's a get in. Let's start thinking about it. That's, a, that's an immediate step that every company can do. If you have a website, here, there's something you can go ahead and start making being more inclusive. Yeah. And, and I see you guys offer audits. If you're curious, if you're listening and you're a company and you're like, I wonder how we're doing on this issue that I've never really thought about before. You guys can uh, connect with Abler and get yourself an audit to find out how you're doing. Exactly. And that's one thing is like, I mean, it's asking yourself what companies like, are we accessible? And if you don't no, definitely reach out to us. And I think a lot of people think accessibility is, do you have a ramp? Exactly. And that's about where it ends for most people. Like this is accessible. Exactly. And that's why I joke and say, we're building the wheelchair ramp for the internet. So it's something that you thought about it from a, from a, from a physical standpoint. Now think about the digital, especially now in, in a COVID environment, everything's online. 
So you need to make sure that everybody can access your information. Yeah. And so that's one of our core businesses. What are some examples of an e-commerce site that has accessibility down? Like they've got it down to a science and they're just crushing it. And what does that look like as a consumer versus somebody that's accessibility is just atrocious? (laughs) So when you go to Target now has a really good experience or Amazon. And these companies, it took them some time. And again, these are big companies, but it... They didn't have it, and then they worked on it. But there's small companies who are doing it really well as well. But just for instance, like when you go to a, a e-commerce site, if you're, the images of your products are labeled, mm-hmm. describing them to me, so that I know, okay, this is a pair of rain boots, right? Uh, I, I need to know what that that image is. If you don't add that alt text in there, I will have no idea what it is because my screen reader is going to read what that image description is. And too often, companies will be like, oh, just leave it as the image JPEG one two three four five six seven eight nine ten, and I, that doesn't make any sense to me. Most web designers probably think of that as an ability to boost SEO and forgot that it's there for a reason. <laughs> That's the funny thing is when you make it more accessible, you're actually boosting SEO. Yeah, and there is a the same way our software you know screen reader looks at the the website. It's the same way that the the web crawlers are, are gathering information for SEO. So, so a okay. good way to write the description in for your website is just to. Just describe what the picture is, correct? Exactly. Describe what the pictures are. Making sure that the, the, the headings are easy to navigate so you can jump through using keyboard um, commands rather than a mouse. And so if you can think about it, if you can go through using your keyboard and have a comfortable experience, then it's, that's a good and The keyboard step. commands, are, are you just using the arrow to navigate your way around the, and then the software is reading it back to you? Yeah, using the arrows, using tabs, using the shortcut keys to jump from section to section. And so those are the ways that we work because as fast as you can navigate with using your mouse, I've got to figure out ways to navigate that site. And so that's why when you hear us using a screen reader, we're listening at super fast speed. And because we want to gather as much information yeah. as you can see it, we've got to just gather. I'm curious about that. How long did it take you to learn to understand uh, speech at that rate? Yeah. So when, when I met Ed Summers that summer, all I did was start listening to audiobooks. And I started pumping it up. But they'll only go at 2x, right? Oh, no, you can get up to three and a half. Oh, okay. Uh, well, yeah, so I started pumping it up, pumping it up, <laughs> pumping it up. And so the more I started pumping it up, that was one of the, that was one of the skills I had to learn mm-hmm. was speed listening. Because I, I heard Ed do it. And it's, I had no idea what, what was going on. But he was actually hearing it at 100% on the voiceover. And that's what I had to practice before I even started using the actual screen reader software. I trained myself to listen. And it's funny when I show people this, now my sister, my friends, they're all speed listening because they can get through so much content. Yeah. You know, I listen to your podcast at one and a half, two X. So it's so funny for me to hear your actual voice versus. Yeah, I'm like, why is that guy so slow right now? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know he was so slow. I can see that. Yeah, because I edit a lot of podcasts and I've been trained in my ear to be able to edit at three and a half X because it's much more efficient. And it, at first it sounded like gibberish yep. and then like a couple of weeks go by and I'm retaining half of it. And what I realized is when I'm reading a book, I'm actually reading at the pace that I'm training myself to hear at, yep. but it's just that skill was not developed in my brain. The wires weren't connected somehow. It just took a lot of practice. Yeah. But it's a skill that everyone, to you are a perfect example. Everybody can, it doesn't matter if you have a disability or not. It's not like I lost my eyes and I have a new sense of, you yeah. know, but this is something that everyone can train themselves. And in today's environment where we have so much content, it's, it's a great skill for anybody. Yeah. So what are some of the best ways to make sure that video is accessible online? Because you're talking about digital accessibility. Video is a huge part of the online experience nowadays. Yeah. So making sure that there's captioning. The thing about it, there's a lot of people who are deaf out there who are, who are going to be using it and having a transcript, having the captioning on there right. so that individuals with, who, are with, who are deaf and hard of hearing can participate as... And accurately translated. Exactly. I remember all the jokes about the YouTube closed captioning translator about four or five years ago when they're like, this is the auto feature and it was nowhere near. <laughs> oh, it's so <laughs> terrible. It is terrible. Some of the good things right now, with, you mentioned Zoom and Teams earlier. Those are two very good accessible video conferencing platforms. And both of them also have transcription on it. And so that's there. So they'll transcribe live or you can watch yeah. something back? Yeah. Microsoft Teams can definitely do it live. And so with uh, Zoom, you have to, there's a delayed or. And is there, is there conversion rate pretty good? Is it like 95% up? It still needs a little bit of work, but it's pretty good. I bet the challenge is when people are far off their mics and stuff, it probably gets a lot worse. That's exactly right. You so, so you got to get a good mic if you want it to be accessible <laughs> or if you want the translation to work well. Yeah. I did an interview with a, somebody over at Lowe's last week who's deaf. And then it was good for her to be able to hear what I was saying, Mm -hmm. but her transcription, it was a little bit challenging. So we had to go through and kind of correct it. But, you know, those are small, 
small yeah. issues to make sure that everyone can participate. You know, trying to run through the drive through speaker thing into the into a transcription software is just not going to work. <laughs> yeah. It was, it's really amazing what these tools are doing right now. And it's great that companies like Microsoft are thinking about it from the design phase. Yeah. So when you're building these new products, think about accessibility at the foundation. That way you're not bolting it on later on. So the spoken word seems like the, the place to start with video content. What about the description of what's happening? What does that look like in an accessible world? Yeah. So you can do this audio descriptions like the, um, so if you, on your, not, not if you have Netflix or anything, you can turn it on and okay. you can hear it and be like, I'm going to check that out. Yeah. Go, a man's walking into the room, sitting at a chair. You know, oh, and, and somebody it, narrates it. Like yeah, somebody's an narrated. audible voice. Okay. Yeah. In the background, you'll hear a very, it's a lower voice and they describe so you can make the difference between when a character speaks and what the, the yeah. narration is. Like yeah. reading the screenplay in a sense. Exactly. Like reading the, the screen descriptors. That's exactly right. So you're going to have that, that participant in the background. And so if you go to a play even, a lot of the plays now also have here, the, the, the art scene here has really taken accessibility into consideration. And so you can get an audio description of the of plays and, and things throughout the Triangle's art scene. Very cool. Yeah. Anything that's still going on. Thanks, COVID. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it is pretty cool that they are thinking about it and they're being inclusive of uh, all people. And they even have people with a uh, sensory disability. They, they allow people to touch them and feel so they can understand what's going on. Yeah. It's really cool. Well, this is really awesome, man. I'm really excited about what you guys are doing. And do you have any kind of success stories you can share? What's Abler been is putting some stuff in the win category we can celebrate with you guys? Yeah. When we just finished up Durham Tech's website, and making sure that they're accessible. We're actually launching an Abler Ally program because we realized that partnerships are really going to how we're going to grow mm -hmm. this business because our goals are, are much broader than just making a quick buck. We really are trying to change the mindset of companies and we need partners. And so we have a referral program now, a partnership program, what we call the referral allies. Then we have a agency allies. So web development firms or people who are developing content who are working with their clients, they, we want them to think about accessibility as part of their DNA. And so we're trying to work with them with different companies. So it's really exciting right now to see where we're going. And we're working with a large biotech firm here in the triangle to help them get some people hired in, in their call center. And so it's, uh, there's a lot of cool things in the pipeline, but you know, we really want people to help spread the word of, of Abler and, and uh, look like for a company to work with you guys and engage your services. Let's say there was a company in the triangle or somewhere else that wanted to engage your services, realizing they need to do better with accessibility online. What would that process look like? Yeah. So one of the first things they do, you know, when they can reach out to us, we'll want to scope out what their, what their ultimate goals are and then understand how many, what their website's made up of, templates, pages. And we want to really start with a, a sample set so that it can be attainable. Mm -hmm. We don't want accessibility to be out of reach. And so we'll find those, those key pages. We'll help make sure that they're accessible. We'll give them recommendations on remediation. And then we share best practices because we don't want to just give you the fix it. We want you to learn how to, how to take what we just did and then you can take it to the rest of your pages. Yeah. And then we can help, um, make sure and do spot checking throughout, but it's a continuous thing. Accessibility is a ongoing process. It's not a one and done. Yeah. Is there any kind of regulation right now, either being discussed for online accessibility? Cause I assume that you can, if you're getting audited, you can fail an audit. Yep. Is there any kind of repercussions that companies have to worry about at this point? Is there any kind of regulations that say you have to at a bare minimum do this? Yeah. So there's web content accessibility guidelines out there and Right now, the only people who are really required by law to do it is federal. I was going to say government. government yeah. <laughs> and anybody who receives Good. funding from federal. They're like, look, government. we're following the rules before we get ready to reinforce them. But it's all, again, they're based on these other requirements. But the Americans with Disabilities Act, because it was written in 1990 and the Internet was available in 1993, yeah. there was this gray area. And so companies are also required to comply with it. And so last year, Domino's Pizza got sued for the not having an accessible website. They took it to the Supreme Court and Supreme Court said, yeah, you have to make it accessible because it's a reasonable accommodation. Wow, what a kind of weird thing for Domino's. Just fix your website instead of go to court for crying out loud. Like it's going exactly. to be less money to fix your website than to fight something in court. Exactly. And, and luckily they cited on the right way. But because of that gray area, it opens up more lawsuits, which is a problem. But if they had clear regulations, they wouldn't have as much 
lawsuits, yeah. people would just do it. So the the Americans Disability Act hasn't been modified at all since 1990, pre-internet. They, they've done some changes, but it hasn't been. They were hoping to get some of those regulations in the, this past four years, but it, it, we'll have to see what's going to happen yeah. down the road. But yeah, it's a, if companies just, it's not a very hefty in, in, expense to do it. And, and it's something that once you get, it, it's going to be, it's there and you're going to be able to build on it. Yeah. And I liked what you said too about the second step being, so that's your external website, but your internal communication as a company, imagine you're a company of 500 people. You're not going to get very many disabled employees to work there if you don't have anything in your internal communication that provides accessibility for people. Because like you said, that proximity builds empathy. Like people aren't even thinking about inclusion, let alone if the jobs page doesn't have anything on there that, that allows somebody with a disability to read the jobs, you're like in a self-fulfilling oh, yeah. cycle there. People are like, oh, we don't have anybody with disabilities. Well, your career page wasn't accessible, <laughs> yeah. so then, of course, they're not going to be able to apply for it. And then, right. oh, why do we need people? We need internal systems. Well, you didn't have anyone who applied, and now you don't right. have any internal systems. But that's why it's really important to have people with all abilities at the table when you're designing these. And it's often created by able-bodied people. And when we think about the workforce of the future, which is now such a big hot topic, and people with disabilities are going to be part of that. And also you're going to have people who just want to be much more inclusive and uh, and have a diverse kind of workforce. And when you see the, the benefits, one thing that Matthew Schwab talked about is like the problem solving. Right. People with disabilities are problem solvers and what company doesn't want a problem solver? And just any kind of solution, really, if you get a larger diversity of people around the table, isn't that called Q? Like when you have a team, like the ability of your team's diversity or, or if it's Q, I think it stands for a variable, almost like algebra kind of thing. Like yeah. you're not going to have these gaping blind spots that companies that are filled with 35 year old white guys are <laughs> going to have. I don't know if you got to listen to the Netflix movie called The Social Dilemma. I watched it this weekend. Did yeah. you really? Okay. Yeah. So that was actually what made me think one of the guys who I think he was the, the guy that was one of the leads designing the like button brought up that very point. He's like, never before in culture has like such a non-diverse group of people set the stage for what millions of people's daily experience are going to be. Like here we are in Silicon Valley designing Facebook and Pinterest and these programs that are used by millions and millions of people. And we're just completely a non-diverse group. Yeah. And so we find ourselves like how much better would social media be if their team's Q would have thought of some <laughs> of the things that are the struggles that we're dealing with now. And that's one of the things when we think about AI and the future machine learning, mm -hmm. it's when you, if the person who's building it, right. Isn't that diverse? That was the scariest part of that movie for me when the guy admitted, we don't know what the algorithms are doing anymore. Like, yeah. We right. set them on the path and now we're like, I don't know why I made that choice. Exactly. Like, oh right. gosh. <laughs> and, but we don't realize how much we're using machine learning, whether it be with looking at resumes, but then certain resumes, it's going to be looking for a specific resume type. But if somebody with a disability, I was lucky to continue working throughout my vision loss. But some people may have a gap, but because of that gap, they may have been doing something while well, they, they may have been incarcerated, but now they're going to be out of the queue because out of the equation, because the algorithm didn't, you know, sees it as a poor candidate. And if you're not aware, you haven't looked for a job in a while, you, when you apply now online, it takes, you have to get past an algorithm to have a human look at your resume exactly. nowadays. So it's not just as easy as, Oh, I know Jim and I'll just send this over here. When people apply like on Indeed or a job site or whatever, there is an algorithm that is designed to catch through keywords and through ever what makes the algorithm work, what could serve up the pile of job leads that they're actually going to have a human review. Exactly. And so again, it, and who built that algorithm? Who started it? And HR. <laughs> so that's what we have to start getting people to think about this. It has to start at the design phase. Yeah, that's fascinating. So what can, so you said the partnership thing is important. Uh, somebody that could benefit from your services, check out able360.com. What are ways that people can get in contact with you or support the initiative that you guys got going on? Yeah. So we're also trying to, on LinkedIn, people can follow us on LinkedIn. We're also trying to get on Instagram. And I got on Instagram just because I wanted to share my story. And when I went on Instagram, people aren't adding alt text, just like we talked about. They're not describing the images. And 70% of people are on Instagram, but and young people in particular. And so 
if 70%, then we're going to be excluding all these people who are blind because they can't participate if people aren't doing alt yeah. text. So I've been getting on there now. And Is alt text on Instagram just writing a description of it, like using the actual feed under it? Exactly. So if you go to... So people you, are just taking pictures and that's it. Here's my picture. Oh, so you can do the comments. And then when you go to, there's advanced settings. Mm-hmm. And then there's something that says add alt text to help people who are blind. And you can you can add the description of what your image is. It doesn't take any extra real perk. It just describe what the picture is. And so... We're on Instagram with ABLR360, A-B-L-R and then my uh, Instagram handle is, is John, J-O-H-N-G, Samuel, S-A-M-U-E-L. And uh, yeah, so on Instagram, Wouldn't on Wouldn't it be something if adding alt text boosted you in the algorithm so you actually became more popular on Instagram? Exactly. And that's what I, it was funny. I was watching a YouTube. It'd be hard to believe that it wouldn't. Why would they put it there if they wouldn't put it in the algorithm? Exactly. So, and it has those key words too. So it's still going to right, be it's another place to write your keywords. Yeah, exactly. So it still has those keywords. And so it's so, under advanced settings, you say advanced settings. Hmm. And so on LinkedIn, you can do it. You have to, if you're posting a picture on LinkedIn, you can do it only on the computer, on the desktop. You can't do it on your mobile phone, but on Instagram, you can do it on your mobile phone and you can do it on your desktop. But most of them on Facebook and, and Twitter, social media has it. It just takes that extra step. Do you think we'll ever get to the place where there's going to be a tool that will be able to add alt text, like some AI tool? Like I know that the recapture images that you see from Google that you know that Google's just help or recapture is just training some AI and yeah. you're just helping out when you're filling out a form and find the traffic lights and then you have to click it. So you're training it. We're all helping. We're yeah. all helping train this algorithm. How far off do you think it is from being useful? And that's when, so there is AI. That's one of the pieces that they've added. So they now automatically add description. But it's completely off. It doesn't tell me. It's like the early YouTube thing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and people are trying to bring AI to accessibility. But at the end of the day, nothing is going to beat an actual human going right. and doing the testing. And that's what ABLR is, you know, ABLR is really about is we actually employ people with disabilities to do the testing because who knows it better than an actual person who's using assistive technology and going through it. Yeah, you're always going to get a much better white glove experience with a human touching it than relying on an algorithm for sure. Exactly. That's awesome. Thanks so much for coming on, John. This Thanks, was a John. ton of fun. Yeah, no, this is awesome. Thank you so much. And yeah, yeah it's great to actually hear you in person. And, uh, <laughs> My yeah. super slow voice. <laughs> yeah. <Exactly. laughs> I wish you guys continued success and I hope you guys have a great day. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. We love making this stuff for you. You can help us out by subscribing wherever you get your podcasts. Get unstuck, tell a better story and have a good answer to the question. What are you doing today? We'll